Thank you so much, uh, Professor Chomsky, for giving me this opportunity to interview you. Uh, let me get to, to the point uh, about uh, the issue we will discuss today, which will be very much related to what happened in Thailand. Okay. Uh, and the first issue I'd like to raise uh, for our conversation is, is the role of the monarchy in Thai politics. Uh, it is a, a traditional wisdom that uh, the monarchy has become a kind of anomaly. Right and uh, in in for many people, especially for where you, from where you come from in the United States, uh, but I think this the the this cause of the monarchy becoming an anomaly only valid is only valid to a, to a certain extent in Southeast Asia, but because at least there's four countries in Southeast Asia still have different kind of monarchy: Thailand, Cambodia, uh, Brunei, and also uh, Malaysia. Uh, we come to also understanding that the reason that monarchies in these four countries still survive into the modern period, uh, mainly because of uh, these a kind of tradi traditional political values and also manipulation of the political elite, including the ability to resist modernity. Now, I would like to ask you this question of how, what is your perception uh, in regards to the position of the monarchy today? How monarchy could fit in with the modern world, uh, whether monarchy can be compatible with democracy? Well, that is a problem that has been faced by uh, the developed societies, the Western societies for several centuries. And of course, uh, a formal monarchy still remains in many Western countries, uh, England, Spain, Sweden, uh, countries that have moved substantially into the modern world. And the monarchy plays some role, mostly ceremonial, though it still uh, can act. Uh, so for example, the, uh, in, uh, there, there have been times when uh, in the Western countries, the uh, king or queen actually in recent years actually intervened in the political system, but it's unusual. Uh, the move that has been made over the centuries is for the royalty to remain as a kind of a symbol of uh, tradition, uh, connection to the past and so on, but with uh, less and less of a uh, active role in the uh, workings of the society. Not none. You can see it right now in England, for example, where there's a very live issue as to uh, whether the uh, it's being debated right now in Parliament as to whether the uh, planned visit of President Trump would be an insult to uh, the Queen. It's considered significant. In fact, the major newspapers in England actually have correspondents uh, called royal correspondents who just deal with affairs of the monarchy. So now there's a, you know, a marriage coming up of a woman who's partially black and that's raising you know, changes in the British royal system. All of this is very much a live part of uh, life in England, same in Spain, same elsewhere. But the move, and, and it came up in the United States uh, at the time of independence, the uh, 1780s, should the, uh, when the constitution was established, should the uh, president have the uh, characteristics of royalty. Yeah. And in fact, it was not a clear decision. If George Washington, who was elected president, happened to be extremely respected, if he had called for the uh, uh, attributes of royalty, probably the United States would have a semi-monarchical system. Uh, fortunately, I think he was a modest man and he didn't want any of those uh, appurtenances of royalty, refused them all, refused uh, re-election and so on. So the country moved uh, uh, to become a secular, uh, non-royal uh, democracy without uh, uh, not just the king, but no earls or lords or any uh, uh, st uh, st uh, status uh, symbols of that kind, which was unique at the time and is still somewhat unusual. But I would hope that over time Thailand would move in the same direction and the same with the other Asian uh, monarchies. Well, you, you use a number of terms here which I find very interesting. First, you said um, more or less 
modern monarchy is still maintain its ceremonial role. Secondly, you to use this adjective of fortunately that United States never turned out to be like a basic Great Britain. Now, I, I would like to take you back to Thailand this time specifically. I should comment that in the United States, although there is no formal royalty, uh, the sentiment among elements of the population somewhat emulate uh, okay. royalty. So for example, uh, uh, Ronald Reagan, for example, uh, who was not incidentally a particularly popular president, if you look at uh, opinion polls, but after his death, he was turned into a kind of a demigod by uh, an enormous propaganda campaign, the Reagan legacy. And uh, you can read uh, comments by respected intellectuals. So for example, the, at your university, Stanford, the Hoover Institution has published uh, uh, monographs in which they describe, they, they describe Reagan as a, I think the phrase was, uh, a warm and friendly ghost uh, hovering over us and protecting us. Now that's uh, that's uh, attitudes towards royalty, and uh, uh, so, so there's something. And in fact, when uh, you know uh, Princess Diana visited the United States, she was treated as a royal visitor. You know, so the attitudes and the sentiments are sometimes there in dangerous ways, uh, even though the formal structures uh, are not there. Okay. Well, but but that also. Uh uh, paved the way for a, a good discussion for, for the next issue. Uh, as I said, that it would be uh, more specifically about Thailand now. King Pumipon uh, had reigned for 70 years. Everyone in the region, I think in, in a larger world, know of his uh, authoritative and also magical reign under King Pumipon. But he uh, passed away last year in October. And uh, because, because of his uh, continued intervention in Thai politics, to the point that the position of the Thai monarchy the rock Thai monarchy could also mean the stability of Thai politics. Now that he has gone, people in Thailand begin to worry about the new reign. It's happened that his son uh, is lacking in moral authority. And because of that, many people also argue that the coup of 2014 in Thailand was staged in order that uh, the, the, the military in particular would be able to take control of the royal succession because they fear of the new unpopular king. Okay, uh, that is one point. Second point is that it's still very much difficult in Thailand to discuss to discuss monarchy and politics openly. I, I'm sure that you come across this, the the less majesty law. You know, not many countries in the world still have this law, and which protect uh, any any critical comment against the monarchy, uh, and could put could put you in jail for up to 70, 70 to eighty years, something like that. So now this become an obstacle to Thailand's democracy and also human rights. Uh, what would be your message? to the Thai public at large, when they look up to their monarchy. Uh, and also with this existence of, I would say, absurd law still ongoing in Thailand. Well, my own feeling, not just with regard to Thailand, but quite generally, is that uh, veneration of leaders is a dangerous and threatening uh, characteristic of a society. It's true if you venerate the, the monarch in Thailand. It's true if uh, at the Hoover Institution at Stanford they describe uh, Reagan as a, a spirit uh, hovering over us like a warm and friendly ghost. Those are very, uh, it's true if you say Heil Hitler. Uh, any veneration of authority and subordination to external authority uh, carries dangerous implications. And I think societies should find ways to extricate themselves from these uh, conditions of subordination and domination and move in their own ways. Each society has its own way uh, towards uh, establishing a true equality and uh, uh, free participation of citizens in affairs of life and of state. It's a long, slow process. Uh, hasn't really been achieved anywhere, uh, but uh, they're part of the general tendency of centuries of modern history has been in that direction. And in, in general, it's a 
healthy direction in my opinion and the there are periods of regression but impediments should be substantially overcome. Actually the monarch himself can play a role uh, pretty much the way George Washington did just by refusing by uh, 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 putting aside the aspects of the office that require subordination and veneration and the public can do it in its own ways. Thailand of course has unique problems. It's not just the monarchy. I don't have to tell you Thailand has been subjected to uh, military dictatorships uh, far back. Uh, uh, Fibun, uh, others. Uh, the United States regrettably has supported the dictatorship strongly, uh, even supported the Thai dictatorship that had aligned with uh, Japanese imperialists during the Second World War, uh, during the Indochina Wars. Uh, the United States was strongly supporting the dictatorships because of it wanted Thai participation, crucial Thai participation in the assault on Indochina, uh, air bases, troops, and so on. That's, a, that's an ugly record from, I can't give advice to the Thai, they have to work this out for themselves, but from the, the point of view of a US citizen, I think the US role has been quite harmful to Thailand and to potential Thai democracy. Before I move on. As an advocate of the freedom of speech yourself, uh, what is your opinion on this draconian law in Thailand called Les Majestic Law, which basically prevent you from, from criticizing the monarchy? Yeah. Well, uh, the, uh, what's called sometimes sovereign immunity. You cannot condemn the state with words. It's a very regressive doctrine, should not exist. But we should bear in mind that uh, eliminating it is not easy, even in the Western world. Now take the United States. Uh, the United States is probably, in my opinion, uh, maybe first in the world in protection of freedom of speech. But uh, the Supreme Court struck down this doctrine, of sovereign immunity, only in 1964. That's pretty recent. It was in the context of the civil rights movement. The uh, 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 racist sheriff in Alabama charged Martin Luther King and the civil rights movement with libel because they had attacked the state with words. And at that point, the Supreme Court struck down the doctrine. That's the United States. Uh, England still has similar doctrines, others do, and it, they're rarely used, but uh, the doctrine itself is uh, surely unacceptable. Uh, nothing in the social or political system or uh, cultural system should be beyond uh, the possibility of critical discussion. But to overcome this has been a long, harsh, hard struggle, even in the, most, in the countries where the struggle is most advanced. It's worth bearing in mind. So it's a long road to travel, but it's one that should be traveled. Uh, move back to the, to the issue of, of the military. You said before that uh, Thailand has been under uh, military rule for, I mean, every now and then since uh, we abolished absolute monarchy in 1932. Right now, Thailand is still under military government. Uh, since the coup, the latest coup was uh, 2014, and Thailand still holds this, this record in Southeast Asia of having the most coup in the region. Up to this date, I lost count, perhaps 21, 22 coups. Not that's, this is not something that I'm proud of. Uh, looking around, Indonesia has been, has been able to, to withdraw military from politics and has become more or less democratic in the past decade. Uh, Korea also is another good example of uh, the military you know, preventing itself from getting involved too much in politics. Looking at, looking at Thailand, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit pessimistic. Do uh, you have any idea or will of, of how we move ahead? What would be, what, what we must do in, in order to ensure the depoliticization of the military? Or in other words, to ensure that the, the military would not take its advantage, you know, and, and then interfere in politics? Well, I think the other countries that you mentioned uh, provide models of what has to be done. And in fact, Thailand itself has followed the same path occasionally, then there's been regression. But so take uh, South Korea, 
Uh, South Korea had uh, quite a brutal dictatorship, the Park dictatorship. Uh, there was a bitter democracy struggle in the 1980s, which finally overthrew the dictatorship. Uh, it took a lot of courage, commitment, uh, and the, uh, as always, the successes are not 100%. Other forms of authority uh, be were introduced, which still have to be overcome. Uh, Indonesia, the military dictatorship, uh, uh, came into power in 1965 with a horrendous massacre. Uh, hundreds of thousands of people were slaughtered. Uh, the New York Times uh, described it as a staggering mass slaughter. Uh, then the Suharto government uh, uh, had compiled one of the most vicious and ugly uh, human rights records in the world, uh, invaded East Timor, carried out one of the most actions closest to genocide in the modern world. Uh, all of this, incidentally, with the strong backing of the United States and its allies, who are guilty and responsible for these crimes and atrocities, and it's not faced here, which is a severe moral crisis in the West, still not faced. But finally, Indonesia with a uprising a student, a lot of student-led and others uh, did overthrow the dictatorship and has begun a move towards uh, uh, de confronting to a limited extent only limited so far, the crimes of the past and moving towards a degree of functioning democracy. And if you look at the other countries, you see the same thing. Popular struggles and organization do sometimes successfully overthrow harsh dictatorships. Go back to the history of the West, find exactly the same thing. Now, these are the lessons of history. It's never easy, but it's can be done with uh, courage and dedication, often step by step, sometimes substantial changes. Let's talk about a uh, younger generation, uh, Professor Chomsky. Uh, many people have hope for our, our new generation, especially with the coming of the social media, that the social media has become a new platform for younger to express what they think uh, in, in, in a more free way since uh, the state uh, can do little to, to, to prevent them from saying something on, on social media. But I also noticed as well that maybe young, there's also a dark side of younger generation too. Uh, whether they, whether if you think that they're active, but whether they are really politically active. A lot of them come across as being too conservative, even though they are from younger generation. In Thailand too, you know, we have uh, new people, younger people, but, but they seem to agree with what the political elite say, how, how can we explain this phenomenon of younger generation, but at the same time, they could be so conservative. And this was, was also linked to your support to our student mm -hmm. back in Thailand, when he wanted to defy tradition and look what happened to him. Well, these are, again, not unusual phenomena. If you look over the uh, history of uprisings that have led to significant progressive social change. It's very often young people who are in the forefront, uh, the uh, often students. Uh, part of the reason for that is that uh, students at universities are at a period of their lives when they are probably most free. Uh, they've left parental control. They have not yet entered into the uh, burden of maintaining a family, uh, putting food on the table and so on. So they have, that's what the university should be, a period of exploration, uh, free inquiry, uh, uh, searching uh, new ideas and so on. And sometimes that has led to uh, political activism, which has had a significant civilizing effect on the society. Sometimes it leads to passivity, uh, uh, frittering away your time, uh, um, doing something to enjoy yourself and accepting, uh, accepting the uh, uh, norms and demands of uh, uh, the um, traditional authority. Uh, what tr 
to try to explain it is impossible. It's trying to explain why human beings who have opportunities make choices one way or another. That's beyond explanation. We can't even explain why a person decides to lift his finger. You know, these are some of the mysteries about human beings that we don't understand. But we see both things happening over time. So take, say, the United States. The 1950s young people were very passive, uh, obedient, uh, quiet. Uh, 1960s, they were uh, leading a uh, social and cultural revolution, which did in fact civilize the society. Uh, that, to try to explain what you can talk about factors that entered into it in retrospect, but there was certainly nothing predictable. Well, I think we seem to, to cover more or less the, the key issue facing Thailand, especially in talking to, uh, about the, the two key institutions here. One is the monarchy and one is the military and uh, their role and the impact caused on Thai society at large and also our younger generation. Very last, last quick one. Uh, given all this information and also the, the, the problem Thailand is facing, what, how should we expect Thailand in 10 years from now, in your own view? What we should expect or what we should hope for? Those are two different things. Okay. Let's well, begin with, with what you hope for. What should we hope for and what you hope for? What I would hope for is a dedicated effort to confront the regressive elements of the society, to build on the positive and constructive features of the society, which we did not discuss much, but very much exist, and to try to move towards a more just and free uh, social and political community can be done. Well, we talk about what we should hope for Thailand. What Then what should we expect from Thailand? Well, what we hope for and what we expect are not the same thing. What we expect, we really can't say. These are matters of will and choice. Yeah. It's up to Thai, the people of Thailand to make the decision as to what will happen in their hands. Can't predict it. What we should hope for is a, a continuation of efforts that have existed throughout the years to struggle to create a more just and free society, overcoming the regressive elements of Thai uh, society and culture, building on the positive and constructive elements, which certainly exist. We have not discussed them much, but they're definitely there. Uh, out of this could come a much better future if people make the decision, and it's in their hands, to grasp the opportunities that are available to them, to face the often difficult uh, impediments, uh, often repression that comes with it, and to work towards a better, more just and free world. Professor Shom Shomsky, thank you so much for giving us some time. Thank you. Good, Good to time. talk to you. Good Good time. Time. Thank you.